Let's uh, bring in right now columnist for the New York Times and contributing writer at The Atlantic, David Brooks. His latest piece is titled The Terrifying Future of the American Right. David, uh, a terrifying uh, look into the future. Explain. Well, terrifying for me, uh, it was a conference in Orlando in November called the National Conservatism Conference. And it was some of the bright young things who, are, who populate the building behind me, young Heritage Foundation staff, uh, young journalists, and a bunch of senators, Senator Cruz, Senator Hawley, Marco Rubio. And the basic view was people in my generation were naive. We thought that left and right sort of wanted the best for the country and just disagreed on how to get there. And that is viewed as just passe now. Uh, the people at this conference kept saying, the left wants to destroy us. They despise America. They hate America. It was sort of an apocalyptic Olympiad there. And so what you saw was that the due tone of the Republican Party, sort of the intellectual wing of Trumpism, which is they're out to get us, they control everything, and we need to fight back using state power. And that's not something I ever heard on the conservative side of things in, in the years I've been sort of covering American conservatism. So, David, it's a question that's been asked quite a bit over the last five or six years, but where have the Bush, Reagan, Mitt Romney, John McCain Republicans landed in this Trump era? What, uh, what is someone like Joe, for example, who, who left the party, what are they left with at this point when all the power and influence seems to come from Trumpism? You know, they're fighting. Uh, if you go over to, say, the American Enterprise Institute, which is sort of the mainstream conservative think tank and the biggest one, uh, there are people over there who say, no, this is not the future of the Republican Party. They take on board some of the critiques the national conservatism makes, which is that we have an elite, which is now a conglomeration of big tech corporations and big media, and there's a populist rebellion against that, relief, that elite. They take that on board. And their argument is that Trumpians have a lot of, they're good at fighting the culture war. They have no positive agenda. And so if you take sort of what would have been the folks who were in the Bush administration, they've moved to the right. They've a little more against free trade. They're a little less against foreign intervention. But they want to use state power in much smaller ways, but to help the working class. They've come to acknowledge it's a working class party. Uh, but they are not nearly as apocalyptic in tone. They're not nearly as hysterical about immigration. Uh, and they're not much as culture warriors as what you would call the Trumpians. David Susan Del Percio here. Call me passe. I'm very passe. Um, still in the Republican Party, but still trying to find a place to land because it is not with Trumpism. But one thing that we've seen, especially since uh, the January 6th uh, insurrection, is that Republican state parties, especially, are drilling down into local races. They're drilling down into their operations as far as election workers. I've heard things like Steve Bannon has targeted the top 20 clerks in the five states in which uh, President Trump lost to actually get them elected into positions. Can you talk about the need for Democrats to, to match this and to really, instead of talking a lot of times at 20,000 feet, to get down into the trenches to keep us a democracy? Yeah, or even mainstream Republicans. You know, after I went to this National Conservatism Conference, I went out to Oklahoma. I was with a lot of Trump people. I went out to West Texas. I was with some Trump people. Uh, and they were Republicans, but they were not this brand. They were not Steve Bannon. And when I described to them what I just heard or what Steve Bannon might stand for, they looked at me like I was on Mars. Like, they said, no, we're a business party. We're a free market party. That's still their Republican Party. But as we've seen again and again in history, uh, go back to the Russian Revolution, uh, you know, a small vanguard that's really motivated, that thinks about this stuff 24 hours a day, can have immense power. And we happen to be an age where majorities don't rule right now. Angry minorities rule. And this is not only true in America, it's true across the Western world. You're seeing people of this sort in France, a guy named Eric Zemmour is about to run for president, sort of the Tucker Carlson of France. Uh, and. These are people are on the move because of the information age. There's just a lot of resentment against what's perceived as the corporate <laughs> cultural elite. 
Hey, David. Good morning. Jonathan Lemire. I wanted to pick up on what somebody said a minute ago about the culture wars and what you heard there. And it certainly seems, as a Republican strategist put to me recently, uh, it seems like the ethos for many in the party right now is simply own the libs. Uh, it's not about policy. It's not about uh, ideas for constituents. It's simply about the gotchas. Uh, and I wanted to get your thoughts on what you heard there, uh, particularly we've heard from Senator Josh Hawley, even on things like manhood, manhood, the left, big bird, whatever it might be. What is the animating principle on these culture wars you heard? Well, it's based on the idea that there's a culture in sort of coastal cities that is not the real American culture, and it's trying to take away church. It's trying to take away manhood. Josh Hawley's interesting. You know, Donald Trump doesn't have to talk about manhood. Uh, Hawley is like a, a poser. He's trying to fake it, so he has to talk about it. But he understands the issues that resonate. Uh, and I think what was interesting to me was, you know, the culture wars, Trump was culture war. He's not a policy president. What was interesting to me about what's emerging on the right, and this is true of Rubio, it's, it's true to a lesser extent of Ted Cruz, is we need to move beyond the culture wars. Uh, the, the argument is we on the right don't control the media, we don't control the universities, we don't control the corporations. We only have a shot at controlling the state. And we have to use state power to enforce some sort of basic American rule. And that's why there's such great fervor for Viktor Orban, the Hungarian authoritarian, who uses state power to help influence the media, to ban the teaching of transgenderism in schools and other things. And so what struck me is they want to move beyond just the culture war of things, which they can win, uh, uh, to actually using government, which is, which is almost, you couldn't say a lot of this stuff on the Republican Party 10 years ago, but now it's very sayable by people like Marco Rubio, who say corporations are not our friend. Corporations are the enemy, and we need to, you know, break them up. We need to regulate them. Uh, that's just the different Republican Party than a lot of us are used to. David, good morning. This is Eddie Glaude. Great to see you. Let me ask good this basic you. question. What you heard, would you describe it as fundamentally illiberal? There, there's a difference. Some of the people there are blatantly illiberal. They say, given the threat uh, from the left, we can't afford neutral liberal institutions. And they're not shy about saying that. They're saying liberalism has broken down. There's a guy named Patrick Deneen who wrote a whole book on the idea that mm -hmm. liberalism is now a failure. There were other people who say, no, no, we, we still need our liberal institutions. We still need to rely on the state. We still need the normal democratic elections and, and liberal institutions. And so the effort of this conference was to marry the people who have said liberalism is done to those who say, I'm liberal, but I'm against the left. Uh, and so there, there's a debate about that. But it's, it's striking to me how we were raised with the idea of liberal democracy. That's our system. That's what won the Cold War. That's what won the World War II. And that's now very much an open question across the Western world. Well, David, we, we, we grew up believing in liberal democracy, and as conservatives, we grew up believing in small government, the government that governs least, governs best, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, but you're, you're right. You now have illiberal forces claiming to be conservative who also, again, want to use state power. It's just, it, it's laughable how, uh, you know, governors like DeSantis and Abbott uh, declare themselves to be conservatives, and yet they're telling businesses what they cannot do to keep themselves safe. And we see that time and again um but i do I, I do i do want you if you could for us underline the point you made before that I, that we've talked about this with also you can't say all republicans are this or all trump supporters are that because i can tell you a lot of the trump people in my neighborhood um people who voted for trump you start talking about it. We don't talk politics much, but a lot of times if Trump says something crazy, they'll they'll like see me, you know, walking around the block and they'll laugh and they'll, ro they'll roll their eyes going, good Lord, did you see what he said today? And it wasn't celebratory. It was kind of like, we can't wait till we can vote for DeSantis or vote for somebody else. So you're right. There are a lot of people that still are voting for Trump or voting for Republicans because they're pro-business. Because they still believe in free trade, they still believe in small government. It's, it's not out there uh, in the national press, but, but Democrats should not underestimate that force out there as well. Yeah, that's for sure. I, you know, because of COVID, I didn't get a chance to do much reporting for a year and a half, and now I'm, I'm out in the states, and it's, 
it's so refreshing because you find exactly what you what you just described, Joe. Uh, you find people who are Republicans for the traditional reasons. Or I was in Southern Virginia during the governor's race, and people, you know, are, are angry about how their kids were treated. They don't want their kids learning that America is a bad country, and so and they're not hyped up on whatever Steve Bannon is smoking. Uh, but and, and they're out there. The question is, do they have institutional power? Do they have voice? Are Republican senators who are running for office afraid of them? And one of the guys at the conference was this guy, J.D. Vance, who's somebody people will know from Hillbilly Elegy, his book and then the movie. Uh, and he's figured out where's the party and he's gone full Trump. And so until the majority can make the J.D. Vance's of the world think, oh, you got to be with us, not with Steve Bannon, then it's a pretty impotent majority. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.